Okay, so welcome to uh, today's segment of the Third Testament Foundation live stream. Um, today I thought about reading a little bit uh, excerpt from the Third Testament, uh, Easter, a little book called Easter, and um, that was written by Martinez in 1942. So that was one of the, not the first book, but it was an early, early work in his uh, 60 year writing uh, spree or span of writing. He wrote for about 60 years, roughly 9,000 pages of text. And <clears throat> before I read, I'm going to read the last two chapters of Easter, uh, the book Easter by Martinez. And, um, before we do that, I'm going to show you a little bit, uh, give you a little introduction to uh, the world picture by Martinez. Um, so the, the book Easter, he talks a lot about uh, Christ and actually the, you know, the whole story of Christ and giving from his perspective. So, and what is Martinez' perspective in, in retelling this story? With the uh, crucifixion and the resurrection, which is tomorrow, yeah, Easter day. So, um, why is it relevant for us to read that today? Well, Martinez um, had what he calls cosmic consciousness, and he attained that when he was 30 years old. He had a uh, an experienced an experience of uh, a, a Christ being entering his uh, his body and uh, some visions and that enabled him to write this uh, work collectively called the Third Testament. So, um, Martinez himself said that um, he never incarnated on this planet before. We can see the planet here, planet Earth. He never incarnated on this planet before um, <clears throat> because this planet is kind of far back in the transition between the animal kingdom symbolized by orange and the human kingdom symbolized by yellow, the real human kingdom, right? So we are in this transitional zone. Uh, and the star representing the entrance into the real human kingdom, also uh, signifying the cosmic birth, and that's where we, uh, as a planet, uh, receive cosmic consciousness, or this evolutionary stage represent cosmic consciousness. Well, what does that mean, cosmic consciousness? Well, if we look at um, like an x-ray of the main symbol, we see again here, that place right here, that three o'clock place where the a star is. So, this is where uh, <clears throat> anyone in the spiral cycle would would uh, receive cosmic consciousness or experience cosmic consciousness because it is where the intuition body, symbolized by blue, is exiting its latent state and entering into its first increasing state. So we see the blue here is latent in the animal kingdom and it's in its first stage increasing in the real human kingdom. So right here at three o'clock is where the first birth of the intuition energy or the intuition body is activated here. And that's what cosmic consciousness means. It's the cosmic birth of the intuition body. And, and that could be planetary intuition body, but also be human intuition body. So um, that's what Martinez experienced uh, when he was 30 years old. And it was actually during the Easter of 1921 that he experienced this. Uh, what is interesting is that he, he said he only incarnated once on planet Earth. And he would never incarnate again. And he also says 
that uh, he came from this evolutionary stage up here in the green in the kingdom of wisdom so we see all these white circles or balls or spheres what you call them they represent living beings with a x1 eye an individual eye a white and then this creative power and these beings here are uh, their creative power is symbolically denoted as green which means they have uh, com they are culminating in wisdom and that's why they're uh, situated in the uh, uh, kingdom of wisdom and that's symbolically denoted by the green color here so Martinus naturally was from this uh, green area yeah this green here and it was very uh, it wasn't a, a deal for him and to actually down uh, step his energy of all his spiritual bodies all the way down to this incarnation step right here down here yeah in the beginning of the real human kingdom so um, <clears throat> that's like he had to down step a whole kingdom and that's about roughly uh, several hundred million years of evolution worth in this one kingdom yeah so imagine what what had to be done to spiritually downstep his uh, radiation or emanation and radiant being or, or consciousness he also states that Christ came also from this uh, kingdom of wisdom symbolized by the green so uh, so that they are very special being beings, and it's very rare that beings like that incarnate on the planet Earth. Mostly beings on planet Earth are beings that are here, right? That naturally uh, uh, co-resonate with the evolutionary stage of the planet Earth. So there's uh, animals, plants, animals, minerals, plant animals, and and transitional beings, uh, half animal half human beings like symbolized by the sphinx being right beings that still kind of have one foot in the animal kingdom where the law is every man for himself and another foot in the real human kingdom where the law is every man for each other right neighborly love so uh, very rarely we see these beings way up from the, the kingdom of wisdom uh, incarnate on this planet and Martina said that was the first time he incarnated on the planet earth and and he was not going to incarnate there again so but we do have his work and what is special about his work is that it is not just a, a intelligence body mental body uh, reading uh, writing this uh, stuff it's written by uh, intuition energy to so see how the intuition energy over here culminates in the divine world here culminating blue but it already uh, has roots r way over here at three o'clock where it begins because that's when it comes out of its latent state as mentioned before so this blue uh, signifying the intuition energy is what makes the third testament special because the Third Testament is not a regular book. The Third Testament is uh, intuition-based text. And you need to read between the lines and not just take it for face value because there is an intuition. There are actual uh, mature, uh, what you call it, ideas and complete results between the lines of the third testament because it's based on intuition it's complete in its in its uh, ideas that are being presented are complete but of course it's wrapped in in intelligence energy in form of the text that we're writing or reading so we have to decipher that with our intelligence body in order to get into the blue 
intuition message that it, that is there between the lines yeah so there is a text and then there's a, the invisible reality that the text is pointing to and that is intuition based and that's very important because not all books have that but the third testament has and of course <clears throat> what Christ said also has those intuition results right because he came from that kingdom of wisdom up here so with that in mind uh, I'll read the last two chapters of the Easter and as always all the symbols are uh, copyright of Matinus Institute um, so the last two chapters I picked those because um, you can read for yourself the whole story. It's very interesting to to read the story uh, that Martinez uh, writes about uh, because um, it's based on intuition energy. So it's it's you see the story, the familiar story of Christ, the the crucifixion and the resurrection and stuff, but you also get Martinez's own perspective from the perspective of intuition so that's very very good to read but I didn't if I had to read that it's gonna to be too long so you can read that on your own yeah it's called the book is called Easter by Matinus so I'm just gonna read chapter 15 and 16 because it, it kind of comments on uh, this story afterwards so when he when he calls it God's great ministry that's the story yeah um, let me just uh, close this one here. So, uh, we have finished the description of God's great ministry. So that's the where he tells the story of Christ doing Easter 2,000 years ago. Yeah? And uh, we've just finished that here. So, uh, we have been... Uh, present at the most beautiful uh, we have been present at the most beautiful miracle in life we have looked at the manifestation of a consciousness so lofty, lofty and pure so loving and angelic that it has become a gospel a revelation and a road for mankind pointed out by God himself away from pain and misery from war and torment from superstition and vileness forward to light and rejoicing to nobility and bliss to a sublime existence in God's proximity to lasting peace on earth but how has mankind accepted this sublime gospel this revelation of love 1900 years afterwards in our time it seems only mysticism to many men but is this really mystical miraculous unnatural most certainly not nothing could be more natural and straightforward perhaps someone at this point would like to protest about materializations but to that one may say that such phenomena have long been accepted by highly developed individuals and their occurrence is denied only by people who have never experienced them themselves. Such protests thus lack authority, no matter if the person protesting be a professor or a doctor holding a high position in society. But in addition, if one must realize, uh, <clears throat> but in addition, if one must recognize that materializations because of their rarity up to the present on earth cannot be proved to a materialistic intellectual and to the great majority of men that does not lower the position of the Savior because his mission was fulfilled abundantly in his everyday activities alone which were visible and comprehensible to everybody and at its culmination it was fulfilled abundantly in the words he uttered in his deepest humiliation Father forgive them for they know not what they do
If the majority of people were to accept and practice the Spirit in these words, this would be enough to save the world. So I think this is a, a very uh, poignant uh, or important point. If the majority of people were to accept and practice the Spirit in these words, this would be enough to save the world. So if we could just accept and practice this, forgive them for they know not what they do, that would be enough to save the world. So this is going behind the theory, behind what the text, because what do we need to do? We don't just need to know the text, we need to practice what this means, right? What does it mean to forgive them for they know not what to, they do? <clears throat> the ordinary man's ability to form a judgment on materialization. So this materialization she's talking about here is is in the text. He explains how uh, Christ materialized and dematerialized his uh, his uh, body, right? And so that's this these appearances by Christ, how he could resurrect and stuff. So that's what it's called, materializations and dematerializations. So the ordinary man's ability to form a judgment on the materializations and on the resurrection made possible by them is about as small as a bushman's power to arrive at a conclusion on the atomic theory. Consequently, the above mentioned materializations cannot be the principal subject in the activity of world salvation but they are, as, as it were, a sacred promise whose fulfillment is certainly experienced by every individual as one of the main results of following in the footsteps of the Savior. Any denial of materializations and any discussion of them is therefore foolish and is only proof of a complete ignorance. But that part of God's great ministry, which the physical senses and an ordinary intellect are capable of understanding, is the physical activity of the Savior. And no other event in history has occurred so openly and made such an unforgettable impression on the spectator as the Christ drama has done. Probably present-day terrestrial science maintains that the Christ drama is unhistorical and unscientific as there is no true proof of its authenticity. But that assertion is based on a mere physical and therefore imperfect power of perception whose only field of activity is perishable material and which is helpless before the ideas and values behind the material phenomena. Present-day material science can thus analyze only the perishable phenomena in the great divine ministry, but not the eternal values manifested by them. As about 2,000 years have passed since then, <clears throat> and as such a period of time, is an inconveniently long distance for a physical inspection. It is natural that there should now be discussions as to whether Jesus had blue or brown eyes or black or red hair or whether he was born of a virgin or whether Joseph was his father or whether he was stoned or crucified, whether he was in this or that tomb and so on or that in modern times there should be assertions that he never existed at all. One can easily understand that such narrow, crippled, or simple-minded ideas hasten, hasten the growth of superstitions. Probably there have never been so many erroneous ideas about any other man as there have been about Jesus of Nazareth. 
every distinction has been attributed to him from that of insignificant crank to the world's soul. The latter form or degree of superstition has very evil consequences when people decorated with high-flown sagacity and call it occult truth. Hundreds of men have let themselves be deceived by such a mistaken idea of grandeur because of it. Their concept of the Savior has gradually deviated so much from his true image that it would be impossible for them to recognize him if one day he were suddenly to appear in flesh and blood before them. In that event, history would repeat itself. The first would become the last on the road with him to the kingdom of heaven. But high above all forms of discussion and mistaken conceptions, high above the perishable matter, there shines forth as an incontestable fact the radiance from Golgotha, the eternal words of the way, the truth, and the life, and living in accordance with them is the salvation of the world. Those words are, without any shadow of doubt, unambiguous and clear. They contain no mysticism, as mysticism and superstition strongly encourage one another and thus have the evil effect of a spiritual cancer. The world saviors try hard to avoid mysticism. They are indeed sources of light. Yet it often happens that mysticism appears around the world savior but the cause of this is usually unenlightened followers who are not capable of conceiving his true greatness and whose crude love for their master together with their unbridled imaginations create grotesque ideas about him. Unintentionally and also unconsciously, they thereby keep the Savior nailed to the cross. As such mistaken ideas are more or less unnatural, they are the cause of indignation in many places and discord among the different groups of followers or sects. <coughs> sects. Because some can see through the mystical elements and others cannot. And very often such mysticisms form unconquerable barriers between intellectuals and the Savior as it is impossible for an intelligent man to believe in what seems obviously unnatural to him, even if he completely lacks the power to conceive the real truth. In that way, many men are kept away from the real truth about the Savior and his teachings. Even his own disciples and priests are often the cause of this, although, of course, unconsciously. If one looks at the behavior of the majority of men on earth in the light of the radiance of salvation from Golgotha, Father forgive them, for they know not what they do. And if one compares that behavior with the way in which the Savior practically demonstrated the idea of the same words, one realizes that the world is still very far from salvation. It is precisely superstition which is in a great measure responsible for the fact that mankind is still living so imperfectly in harmony with the divine radiance from Golgotha, although it has been illuminated by it for almost 2,000 years. Superstition has caused people gradually to incline to treat the idea of salvation in quite a selfish manner so that they have acquired the illusion that one is saved only by praying for forgiveness for errors and sins. Salvation only through the grace of God and the blood of Jesus would mean, among other things, that people would be freed from the consequences of errors and injustices committed against their fellows. 
Because of this delusion, people have finally quite ignored the way of behavior of the Savior and have thought that only Jesus himself or some God could behave in that way and that it is greatly beyond the power of any ordinary man on earth. As a result of this despondent illusion, people have thought good works and sincere, serene conduct valueless as a basis for salvation. People have become victims of the belief in the salvation through grace and forgiveness of sins in spite of the emphatic words of the Son of God. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, like do unto others, like what I was do to you. Yeah, Put up again thy sword into its place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. So that's like not revenge but tolerance yeah blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God God will render to every man according to his deeds and so forth this belief could not be weakened uh, this belief could not but weaken so this is the belief in the forgiveness of sins and uh, salvation through grace instead of your own actions right so this belief could not but weaken and destroy the individual's interest in perfecting his deeds. It became a feather bed on which the interest in the real means of salvation fell to sleep, slept for centuries, and is still, for the great part, sleeping. It is self-evident that a world civilization built on so false a conception of the radiance of world salvation from Golgotha has never and will never become stable and perfect. Wars and revolutions, strikes, lockouts and accidents, unemployment and poverty, illness and crimes in an uninterrupted succession have inevitably followed the slumber indicated above. They are the tribute which must be paid. They are the tribute which must be paid by mankind for fleeing from the responsibility for its own dark deeds. They are God's unconcealed intimation to mankind that its handling of the helm of civilization is clumsy. They are present day living witness of the full agreement between the behavior of the Son of God and the way, the truth, and the life. The path to light demonstrated by the life and deeds of the Son of God has been so encumbered with the stones and hindrances of superstition that it has lost its appeal for thousands of people who find superstition unacceptable. Consequently, such people view all religious phenomena with disgust. They consider believing God is foolish ignorance. But through that attitude, they have themselves become involved in the cancerous organism of superstition because to deny God means denying a fact and denying the logic which says that a machine cannot build itself and a garment cannot come into being by itself. To deny God, the Creator, means believing that dead things create live ones instead of vice versa. And that is a superstition on which no civilization can be based and come to perfection or remain free from wars, crises, degeneration, and so forth. Mankind thus can come to salvation only in harmony with the radiance from Golgotha, which indeed beamed out the message, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So well, that means you can't see God without neighborly love. Because mankind has built up its uh, civilization 
okay, so you can't you can't see God or you can't experience that you're one with God. Um, uh, without neighborly love, that's because your intuition uh, is not activated before you have neighborly love, right? And intuition is what you use to see God, and that when, once you have your intuition body activated, you 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 can day consciously experience that you are in fact one with God. And all beings are always one with God, but it's not always that we can. We're consciously aware that we are at one with God. God is our the essence, the core of who we are as eternal beings. It's our I. So it's all our same I is God. Because mankind has built up its civilization on a mistaken conception of the Savior and his significance, it has not yet come to the Father. Its civilization is a sinking ship. Extreme efforts are being made to keep it afloat, but the defects are too great. The water is pouring in. The end of the world is at hand, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man. But through the fear, excitement, and shouts, through the black night of suffering and despair, there still shines the ray of light from Golgotha, from the Savior. There still vibrates in human ears his last loving message with the promise, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Those on the stricken ship can have faith that in spite of storm, darkness, and a furious sea, they will be led safely to the great salvation. A flood of light is just piercing the darkness off the clouds. Already there is shining and vibrating a great new cosmic impulse, which with transcendent brilliance is directed from somewhere in the center of the Milky Way straight towards the Earth. In its light can be seen the Eternal Father. The shipwrecked mariners, mankind, will abandon the doomed ship, but they will be saved. The earth will soon be shining with a new civilization wherein dwelleth righteousness. Before the light radiating from the face of God, the shades of night must flee. So I thought that was very nicely written, right? 1942. And yeah, very inspiring, I think. Anyway, so uh, happy Easter, and I uh, hope to see you next time on the live stream.